Texas has filed a bill that would make consenting to gender-affirming care child abuse with prison sentences for parents. According to queer legislative researcher Erin Reed, the bill will mean a rounding up of trans kids if passed. She tweeted, in Virginia, a bill has been released which would ban transgender people from sports that match their gender identity if passed. It requires the physical examination to include biological sex. Meanwhile, in Ohio, a motion to force a vote to tell all schools in Ohio that Title IX rights should be denied to trans students has been denied 9 to 10. Hmm. Aaron Reed joins us now to discuss this and to expand on the legislation being introduced across the country. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. So what are your views on these efforts to uh, prohibit this kind of care and such things? Yeah, so I think that we're seeing a national movement by those on the right to essentially ban gender-affirming care, um, force-affirming teachers to misgender and using correct names for transgender students, as well as ban transgender people from participation in many areas of public life. And so I am opposed to these, to these particular issues. Um, but nonetheless, we are seeing these kinds of bills proliferate around the country. So to what do you attribute that? I mean, it, on one hand, it does seem like Republicans are very much exploiting um, a cultural shift, as it were. I think progressives, liberals have largely been winning a lot of victories with respect to LGBTQIA rights for the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, um, and what might be described as kind of the post Will and Grace era. And it has felt like we're winning, winning, winning until you get to this certain point that perhaps there are these moments where culture moves a little bit faster, like uh, maybe popular culture moves a little bit faster than traditional parts of the country, and Republicans are exploiting this tipping point. Is there any conversation happening about whether or not there are moments to, to, to revise and, and reevaluate? So the focus has become on uh, kids under 18 and what might be probably outlier cases of people potentially getting treatment that wasn't well indicated, having regrets, detransitioners are a big part of the conversation. What do people say or what is the in-group, in-community in conversation like about whether or not there is any opportunity there for recalibrating or is it all considered to be in bad faith? So in the post-2016 era, whenever the North Carolina bathroom ban was mm -hmm. passed and then later undefeated, um, we have seen a reaction against transgender acceptance in the United States. And I do think that this is because there has been more visibility of transgender people. Um, people do feel more free to be themselves, to come out, and therefore you see people being transgender in public visibly. As a result, I do think that this is scary to some people. People don't, a lot of times, understand transgender people. And that can lead to misunderstandings that then get targeted via legislation. I think we've seen this with several minority communities in America going back all throughout history. And so I do want to caution um, people from overreading the attempts to ban gender affirming care. Because one thing that I will note is that last year we did have the most ever anti trans and anti LGBTQ bills filed in the United States, something around 250, depending on which source you use. The vast majority of those were defeated, including in red states, places like South Dakota, places like Missouri. Um, and so I think it's important for people to, for Republicans, for instance, not to overplay their hand on this issue. Mm. That's well taken. So I'm seeing some concerns, though, expressed by people, not just people who are Republicans. Uh, there was a write-up in the New York Times about puberty blockers, uh, making note of some objections that even some medical, uh, some scientists people have, that there's not been enough research on how this could affect, um, that it does, in fact, affect bone density in some people. Um, there are studies in uh, Nordic countries and England going on. There's been a kind of, it looks like to me, an easing off of, of how readily um, puberty blockers will be prescribed to very young people. Um, do you, what do you, what do you make of those concerns? And, and, and that's really what we're talking about. I agree with the bathroom stuff, really dumb. I don't know who cares who uses what bathroom and why we're concentrating on that at all. But uh, the concern that parents have that I understand that young people who can't consent to all sorts of things and you know what it, what should the, should the proper process should be given what looked to me like not totally unfounded concerns about um, these medical treatments of course so gender affirming care especially among transgender youth is a very complex issue and given the medical consensus right now in america uh, among all of the major medical organizations in the efficacy of their treatment but also given concerns that other organizations might have and other activists might have. The decision, in my opinion, and in the 
um, opinion of many legislatures around the United States, is that this is a complex decision that should be left between families and their doctors. It is whenever you try to legislate what a family can do with their doctors and with their care teams, that you start running into issues. I do think that for, in your particular case, around detransitioners, for instance, um, they deserve love and support and acceptance, and they deserve all of the resources that we can give them. I will note, though, that the current wave of political detransitioners who are advocating against um, transgender care in legislatures around the United States remind me very similar to the ex-gay movement of the 1990s and the early 2000s. Mm. You have them being paraded out in front of public, uh, essentially claiming that gender-affirming care and that being trans is a fad and it's something that you can fall back from. And this may be true for some people. However, the vast majority of people, and I know many detransitioners myself personally, who detransition don't do so because they're not transgender. They do so because they face family un unacceptance. They face peer abuse. They face the lack of ability to be employed as a result of being trans. And the fear that's within the detransitioning community is high. And so I think that we need to turn down the temperature, especially around detransitioners. I've heard some detransitioners describe that, but also as a pressure to have transitioned in the first place due to a kind of maybe they're not non-binary or they don't easily uh, match male or female stereotypes. And they're, you know, obviously young people are much more fluid in their gender expression, which I am totally fine with. Um, I, I think a concern that some parents or even some scientists, some people would have is that just a broader trend toward gender fluidity that is fine or should be accepted, but then is getting some more of those young people will be swept up and, and will, will be easily affirmed and then maybe transition when actually all they were was gender fluid. So I'm really glad that you brought this up because it's actually in the opinion of many people within the activist community, the high levels of gatekeeping that lead to that. Mm -hmm. Because what you end up having is gender fluid people or people that are um, that may be transgender, but may not be seeking a full medical transition, essentially having to pursue a full medical transition in order to get legal acceptance. Mm -hmm. And so in many states, for instance, you know, you have things like medical transition required for legal acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is in these heightening of gates and the um, narrowing of pathways in which a transgender person can experience being transgender, that I think you do see people that feel like they might have to portray themselves in that way. Do you mean in order to like, uh, like have the right uh, uh, description on an identification card or something? Is, was that description what you're... on an identification card, changing your birth certificate, having sports access to teams. bathrooms, mm -hmm. sports teams, etc. So it's in these laws that are that I think are being proposed in order to prevent that issue, that you're actually seeing it heighten that issue. And so I think that we should allow transgender youth and gender diverse youth to have a variety of options and leave these decisions between the families and their doctors. And I think even in, even in very Republican states, this argument has landed. And people do realize that maybe this isn't something that we should legislate. Yeah, there seems to be something obviously libertarian about your position to say let it stay within between parents and families and obviously that doesn't mean that there are i mean you, you can talk to detransitioners who will make a very compelling case for why they have regrets but that doesn't mean anything about people who want to make a different kind of decision or the fact that living life does not insulate you from having regrets about all kinds of decisions that we make and in other contexts we don't say we're going to take parents away from children remember the context in which we're having this conversation is a bill to make it criminal for parents to support gender affirming care which you should also say is a pretty broad category that has largely gone undefi undefined here but would you also include things like allowing people to uh, choose a, use the name of their choosing and use the pronouns of their choosing and to dress in the way that they uh, choose to be par part of what you would describe as gender affirming care. And is that, that kind of care implicated in a bill like this or is it stricter, is, is it more strictly about medical interventions? It depends on the bill. So in Texas, no. In Texas, it is strictly puberty blockers and hormone therapy. However, we did see in Florida, for instance, the Department of Health uh, release guidance that stated that social transition should also be included. Mm. And so you are seeing an expansion of what they're willing to go after, what they're willing to target. I know that we recently saw in Tennessee a bill that would define um, male and female impersonators, for instance, as being covered under anti-sexuality laws and mm -hmm. obscenity laws. And so um, 
we are seeing an expansion. We're seeing an expansion in age ranges. In some cases, like in Missouri, they propose going up to the age of 25. Hmm. And, you know, I think that people, especially certain legislatures and certain politicians, are focusing in on this the wrong way. And I think that they're actually hurting the people that they're trying to help in doing this. Yeah, I look, I don't have any appetite whatsoever to really get the government involved in this question, or really, really any question. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, just to represent what people who are concerned about this will say, I, I think they have an image in their head of uh, you have a, you have a, a, a kid, a, a young teen or a preteen, uh, maybe a boy, but is interested in dresses, is interested in dolls. If they end up talking to a, a counselor with a more uh, progressive or activist worldview, they might very quickly be put down a pathway toward puberty blockers and transitioning when odds are that kid might just be gay, they might just be a feminine boy, et cetera. That's a concern I hear. Um, it, you know, in your experience from your knowledge of the community, is it, is it as easy as that? Or, do, or is there pushback and interrogation of, well, you know, what do you actually want? Are you just uncomfortable in your body because it's hard to go through puberty and it's hard to be a teenager? You know, those kinds of questions. There's a fear that it's, it's, it's being, it, it, the pathway is, is too easy and then you'll end up getting more false positives given this greater gender fluidity. Of course. And so I speak to many families of transgender youth. I've helped several families of transgender youth. And I can say that of my personal experience, and this is what I can speak to my personal experience, all of them that I've spoken to have had years of psychological care, years of care teams, have met with multiple doctors, many parents initially were unsupportive that have become supportive of transition care for their kids. Not all of them are seeking medical transitions either. I think that this is a complex issue, undoubtedly is a complex issue around gender affirming care for trans youth and the different forms that that can take. But again, I really do think that in these cases where there are complex issues and where there is a variety of medical guidance that you have to, you have to allow families to make that decision. And there might, be, uh, there might be decisions that are wrongly made, but th that's the case I think in all kinds of care that you would get for kids. Yeah, the, the what about the children is really the, the linchpin for a lot of these conservative arguments because they think they understand that it seems extremely invasive to be telling 25-year-olds what they can and cannot do. And it does seem like a lot of the, the, the fear-mongering, the preciousness, preciousness about kids is about specifically people's purient fascination with people's sexuality, their sex lives, their sexual organs in particular. And there is there is a part of my, me that sometimes says, okay, if it's all about the kids, if you can get all these Republicans to let, let go of this by simply saying, we're not gonna do anything until folks are 18, is that is that a concession that should be made? On the other hand, I understand that there are a lot of people who sincerely stick with their transitions who feel like if they had been able to start earlier, if they had been able to start on these hormone block blockers and st stuff earlier, that they would be better able to pass, that their life in, the cho in their chosen gender would be easier because we still do live in a world where people are very hostile to trans people and the ability to pass is somewhat coveted. But this gets back to the point that Robbie was making earlier, how much of this is about people's discomfort with being gender non-conforming and does wanting to help people get access to hormones, et cetera, earlier, is that just me or a good, good well-meaning left person buying into the value of of, of passing. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, like a, it's an interesting back and forth that I have with myself psychologically. Of course, of course. And, you know, I think that there are so many things that have to be considered whenever you're making these decisions. And I think that everybody is doing the best that they can. I truly think that the parents want the best for their kids. I think that the doctors want the best for their kids. I even think that the legislatures want the best for the kids, regardless of Republican or Democratic legislatures. Mm -hmm. And as long as we are approaching this from that perspective, I think that ultimately we have to trust the families, like we have to. Mm -hmm. we, we trust the families in so many other areas of life. And you hear right now parental rights being a big thing around transgender issues. And I think for ideological consistency here, we need to have parental rights in terms of how you determine the care that your kid receives. Hmm. And I mean, we're all doing the best we can. Parents are doing the best they can, as, as they can. And you know, I think that for a lot of kids, for a lot of transgender kids, this care does make a huge difference in their lives. Hmm. Um, and you know, withdrawing that care also would make a huge difference in their lives. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks for joining us, Erin Reed. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Of 
Tomorrow on Rising, we'll be breaking down more of the FTX drama. We'll have Yahoo Finance reporter Kevin Cirilli. You won't want to miss that. Yeah, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content at all. And for those of you who prefer to listen while on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're also available on Roku and other streaming services, so you can catch us there as well. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.